Our first reading today is not in your Bible. So I invite you to just listen for a moment. It is from the Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 6, verses 17 through 20. The beginning of wisdom is the most sincere desire for instruction, and concern for instruction is love of her. And the love of her is the keeping of her laws. And giving heed to her laws is assurance of immortality. And immortality brings one near to God. So the desire for wisdom leads to a kingdom. Here ends the first reading. Our second reading is in your Bible. And it's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, and it can be found on page 1666. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. But I would have not come to you, be it, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the tri trumpet of God, of God, and the dead of Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Here ends the reading. Our gospel reading today, please rise as you are able, is from Matthew chapter 25 verses 1 through 13, and this can be found on page 1381, page 1381. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, 25th chapter. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with the lamps. While the bridegroom was tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out and meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye yet rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the doors were shut. Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you, you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. The Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. I bet you guys 
are always prepared for everything, right? No? No? Isn't that what school is doing? It's preparing you for everything? Uh-oh. We're in trouble. But I bet your mom and dad are trying to prepare you for everything, right? And they tell you to do different things, and you always jump to do them right away, right? Well, wishes. Well, put off today what you can do tomorrow, right? Isn't that what we do sometimes, though? We put off today what we could do tomorrow. And maybe some of us do that a little more often than others. I'm guilty. I'm especially guilty when it comes to homework or anything else that I just don't have some real excitement about, like cleaning my room <laughs> or raking the yard. I don't have to do that right now because I live in a seminary. Someone else does that, so that's a good time. But if you don't have the excitement about it, you always try to figure out how to put things off. You're not quite as prepared as you should be. Now, I know my kids have heard this from me often, and sarcastically at least. Hey, no sense in doing what you're supposed to do today if you can put it off till tomorrow. And of course, you'll never guess I get eye rolls and dirty looks from them. You guys wouldn't do that, would you? Yeah, I would. <laughs> But you never know what tomorrow holds. You never know. I have a daughter that's heard these things so often from me that when she gets schoolwork and it's due in three weeks, she usually has it done at least that first week, if not the second week. In fact, her teachers tell her, you need to get a life. <laughs> You're too prompt. You ever heard the Boy Scout model, always be prepared? Yes? You guys some Boy Scouts for Cubs Cup? Yeah, you? Well, always be prepared. You ever wonder where they might have pulled that, that idea from always being prepared? Well, I used to be a police officer and a firefighter. Bet you didn't know that. And, and when I was a police officer and when I was a firefighter, we would always get lots and lots of training. We would check all of our equipment all the time, making sure that everything was in its right place, Everything was working, and that we were always prepared in case, in case we had to use some of that knowledge or some of that equipment. We didn't wait to prepare or check when something happened. Oh, wait a second. Let me see if I have that. Oh, I don't have my handcuffs today. Oh, I, I forgot to bring the, the fire hose. That would be a problem, wouldn't it? I think some people might be upset. But we always got all this training. We're always ready, ready for whatever might happen. Now, there's all sorts of things that we do to be prepared for many situations. Saving for retirement. Purchasing life insurance. How about auto insurance? Homeowners insurance? Saving up for repairs? And the list can go on and on. We do these things, and we are prepared. <clears throat> We know that we need to prepare because we don't know when we're going to have to call upon those things that we have bought to, to help us. We don't know that tomorrow we're going to get in the car accident, so we can't buy the insurance today. And it's one week from now that the house might burn, so that's when we're going to get the insurance. We can't do that. You ever notice, though, in the Bible, when Jesus is about to say something really important, Really important. He usually starts off with like, very truly, or truly, truly I say. This is a point that Jesus wants you to really pay attention to. It's not that what he has to say otherwise is not important, but these particular things he wants you to really pay attention to. So very truly I say, our gospel today is important. The parable of the ten bridesmaids is one of several parables speaking of the importance of being prepared and not sitting idle. You know, sitting idle is sitting around doing nothing. Maybe this, twiddling your thumbs. So, all these parables are talking about being prepared and not just sitting around. Now, these par this parable and these parables are bookended with the very first parable being the coming of the Son of Man. 
And the last parable is about the judgment of the nations. Now, each and every one of these parables uniquely say, very truly. Every one of these parables says, very truly. They're important. Now, the, the only exception to that is the parable of the talents, which comes just before the judgment. I think Jesus is kind of tailing off just a little because he's going to come up to a little, little more forceful in there. The women in our scripture today are fine examples of being prepared and not being prepared. Five of them brought with them extra oil for the lamp, prepared because they're not sure when the bride, when the bridegroom might show. They may have an idea of sometime that he might be there, but sometimes our plans don't always work out like we expect. There seems to be an assumption, though, on the others that the bridegroom will be there at this particular time. And so they have no contingency plan whatsoever. The bridegroom in this case is parallel to the second coming of Christ. Now, on one hand, we've been told of all these different signs of the second coming. And yet, on the other hand, we've also been told by Jesus that only the Father knows when the Son will come back. Even the Son does not know. So Jesus is saying, I don't even know when, when the Father is going to send me back. Only the Father knows. But there's all these different things that are going to happen. But we just don't know exactly when. So what if we do know exactly when Jesus will come back? What if we knew exactly when that would happen? If we knew the exact hour, the exact day, the exact minute. How do you think we'd lead our, lead our lives? I suspect there's a few people out there that might just lead their lives wherever they want, waiting up to that last hour to say, I am sorry for everything that I have done, because they know exactly when the second coming is. So what are we to do? How can we remain prepared and see all these different signs that we're told that are signs of the second coming, yet not assume that we know when it is? It's a matter of just living our lives each and every day. Each and every day is that Jesus is coming today. Jesus will be here today. That's how we lead our lives. Billy Graham said that many times he prepared himself for Jesus' coming the following day. He said, many times when I went to bed, I would always think to myself that when I awaken, Christ may come. Now you might be saying to yourself, well, I'm not ready. I don't have my house quite in order yet, so I can't have Jesus come tomorrow or today, or next week, or next month, I have to get some things in order. And that crosses my mind as well. I should like to have everything tidied up before Jesus comes. Have everything in a nice row, taking care of all the things I'm supposed to have been doing. Maybe somebody might be saying, well, I've got too many sins and I haven't confessed all of them yet, so I really need to get that taken care of before Jesus comes. All this stuff of what we think we have to be prepared for and have all these things keep getting in our way of doing the things that we've been commanded to do. All this stuff getting in our way of seeing one simple fact. The simple fact that everything that needed to be done has already been done for us in Jesus Christ. Let me leave you with this story. Just before General Eisenhower died, and he is a World War II general who went on to be president, so you guys know. Now, I'm sure that you've probably already been taught that in, in history, right? Say yes. <laughs> that way nobody thinks that they're not teaching the history. But General Eisenhower, um, before he died, Billy Graham was invited to see him at Walter Reed Hospital in Washington, D.C. And Billy Graham is a, a very well-known preacher. He was told that he could stay only 30 minutes with General Eisenhower. 
When he went in, the general was wearing his usual big smile. And boys like to have a big greeting smile. Now, even though he did, knew that he didn't have very long to live, he still had this smile. Later, Billy Graham told what happened. And he said, this is what happened. When the 30 minutes were up, the general asked me to stay longer and said to me, Billy, I want you to tell me again, how can I be sure my sins are forgiven and that I am going to heaven? Because nothing else matters now. So Billy said, I took out my New Testament and read him some scriptures. I pointed out that we're not going to heaven because of our good works or because of our money that we give to church. We are going to heaven totally and completely on the basis of the merits of what Christ did on the cross. Therefore, he could rest in the comfort that Jesus paid it all. After prayer, Ike said, Thank you. I am ready. Amen.